three parts to the message this morning. The first is kind of an intellectual, logical thing to explain the resurrection. The second is what I'm going to call the whole ball of wax. The whole ball of wax. And the third is that we're all Italian. So you have to wait for that. First, when we're kids and we hear that Jesus rose from the dead, a, a child processes that at a child's level. And so it's a, we think of Jesus as rising from the dead as something akin to a resuscitation. So I think about wakes. We don't go to wakes very much these days, do we? But it's almost as if we have someone that's laid out in a wake and the person just kind of pops up out of the casket. And that's how I think a lot of children and sometimes adults process the idea of the resurrection, that it's really a resuscitation. And there's some problems with that idea. And I think it's important for us to recognize this. The first problem is that uh, in this story, especially Mary doesn't recognize Jesus. What did he look like? The <laughs> she thought he was the gardener. I, I tell you, if my father, who's been dead for many years, walked through that door, I would recognize him in a second. I think most of us who have lost loved ones, if they were suddenly to appear, we would recognize them immediately. So what did Jesus look like? Now, there's another story of the resurrection where Jesus is walking with two of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they didn't recognize him either. So what did he look like? Well, that's really intriguing. And then there's another story where, where the disciples are in a locked room, and Jesus appears, the door is locked, you know, they're walled in, and Jesus suddenly appears. Well, <laughs> How do you walk through walls? So how, how did that take place? So that's very interesting. This is obviously not a resuscitation. What I mean by that is if you, you feel your hands, uh, it, this, is, this is us in history. And, and so there's the Jesus of history, and then there's the Christ who appears. And the Christ who appears is shrouded in a kind of mystery. What was he like? So there is continuity between the Jesus of history and the Christ who appears. But there's also this discontinuity. This isn't the Jesus of history. He could walk through walls. He was not easily recognized. So there's both continuity and there's discontinuity. It is not a resuscitation. It is what we call the resurrection. The bottom line here is they experienced Christ's presence. They experienced Christ being present, Christ being alive with them. Now, what exactly that was like, and that's, again, shrouded in mystery. Now, the next point that I want to make, uh, which I think is, is very important for us to process, is that in the early history of the church, uh, there are folks that said, this is just a made up, this is just all made up. Jesus didn't rise from the dead. There is no Christ of faith. This is just concocted by these, by these disciples. And I suspect there are a lot of adults who believe that. What is intriguing about that, it's kind of like the original conspiracy theory. You know, right? what's intriguing about that is that in that culture, uh, women were really at the bottom of the rung. They were, they were property. And women were not seen to be reliable. They could not even testify in a court of law. So if you're going to create a story, why would you have women as the chief witnesses to Christ being alive. That makes no sense. Because women were disregarded. The second issue, which is a kind of a logical issue on this, is that all of the disciples, the close followers of Jesus, were all persecuted for their belief, and they were killed. If it was a made-up story, 
Would you give your life for something that you knew was a made-up story? I don't think so. I don't think so. So when we look at these stories, and we look at the evidence, and we consider all of this, what we, what we come out with is this recognition, again, the lowest common denominator, that Jesus was experienced as being alive with them, the Christ of faith. And there is continuity between the Christ of faith and the Jesus of history. And there's also this discontinuity. So the Christ of faith is shrouded in this kind of mystery. What was Jesus like? What was the Christ of faith like? We don't, we don't, we don't know. That's the mystery that we live into. The mystery that we live into. Now, I said, secondly, the whole ball of wax. The whole ball of wax. Jesus came that we may have life. And that we may have it abundantly. But we have life. Jesus came not to make us miserable. But Jesus came to lead us to new possibility and new potential. And one of the great tragedies is that this possibility is there for us. We say this. Follow me on this. Jesus gave us these signs that would help us recognize that we have this new possibility and potential. Jesus gives us baptism and says, you know, God is with you. Here's a visible sign to help us recognize that God is with us. This power of God, a power that's even greater than death. That's what the resurrection tells us. This power is even greater than death. This power is with us. And Jesus gave us these visible signs to help us. Baptism is one. Communion is the other. He is with the disciples. He said, look, I am with you. Here is my body. Here is my blood. I am with you. You have this within you. And these are visible signs to help us understand that we have this potential. We have this possibility. We have this reservoir that we can tap into, a reservoir that's greater than even death. And one of the great tragedies is we don't recognize that. It's like having a great pool in your backyard. And we sit and we say, oh, that's a nice looking pool. I really enjoy the pool. It's a really beautiful pool. Isn't the water nice? But we never jump in. You, we enjoy the pool. We enjoy looking at it, right? But we don't take that extra step to find out what life could be like by jumping in. In other words, we leave a lot on the table. We leave a lot on the table. I'll give you a personal example. Uh, last uh, September, I talked to a life insurance person. I had to increase my life insurance policy life insurance policy and they wouldn't do it they said you're too old oh, no. you're gonna die and we're gonna lose money on you <laughs> so i said okay you're gonna have to go through all these medical tests we want to make sure we're making a decent investment and that you live long enough for us to make a profit so our shareholders will benefit from you so, that's how it works so i went through all these tests and the insurance company called me they said, we wish we had your numbers. The woman who said it was 20 years younger than me. I said, well, I feel good. She said, you ought to feel good. We'll give you the policy. I said, good. I felt terrific. That was September. Felt fantastic. How are you feeling, John? I feel great. And then in December, I had a little come to Jesus moment. The Christ of faith knocked on my door. And I decided if I keep going in this direction, it's not going to take me to a very good place. Needed to make some changes. I decided to jump into the pool. I wasn't going to look at it anymore. I decided I was going to tap into this. I was going to tap into that. And every day I prayed. I still pray every day. I ask God for help. Because on one level, God who is greater than death opens for us new possibility. But the, on another level, we have to recognize our limitations. So I prayed. I'm not going to tell you what I did. 
You know, if you bug me, better they will. <laughs> Four months later, I can't begin to tell you how much better I feel. I cannot begin to tell you. Why? Because I dared to tap into that power. I dared to jump into the pool. And that pool is there for all of us. We hang out in the pool in our backyard. We all do. Can I tap into the Christ of faith, the power of the resurrection, to, lead, to live into that abundant life that Jesus wants for us? Can I jump into the pool? I'm, I'm happy this way. I'm just happy. Uh, to experience a complete joy. Jesus said, I've come that your joy may be complete. Can I jump into the pool to experience the complete joy? But the problem for many of us is that we're content to settle. And there's so much more there. That's what the resurrection's about. It says there's life. There's life. Can we live into it? Or do we leave all that stuff on the table? Where are we going to go? And it just doesn't pertain to how you and I live our individual lives, but it has to do with how much we can contribute to other people's lives. How much we can help other people. How much of a support we can give them. How much encouragement we can give them. Can I turn to God's strength and God's power and say, Lord, take me from where I'm at and show me that path that I can live into, I call it third day of living. We're content to live in the first day or the second day. And as the third day is the way to go. Third day living. He rose on what day? Third day. Third day, third day living. I want to live into that third day with Jesus. That's what I want to do. Third day living for us. That's the whole ball of wax. That's really the story of the resurrection. That God is bigger than death. God is bigger than our fears. And God can take us to those places. Finally, we're all Italian. Even you, Beverly. <laughs> Even you are Italian. Oh, yeah. A good friend of mine was in reserve off. Has anyone here been in ROTC? He was in ROTC. He went into the military and he was in the army and he was in the Delta Force. Does anyone know what the Delta Force is in the army? It's, They're like, Army, version. Army version of the SEALs. Behind enemy lines, these are the elite troops. He was a lieutenant in the uh, Delta Force, and then he became a captain in the Delta Force, and then he quit. That's gun yeah, he was. He quit. And he quit, and he started to work for the State Department. And then he started to work for the CIA. Oh. And he became the bureau chief for the CIA in Poland. And he was responsible for tracking down the bombers that blew up the Lockerbie plane. Remember the Lockerbie Pan Am plane? He was in Berlin and responsible for tracking all those people down. And then he came down with cancer and he was dying, 45 years old. And he was in Washington, D.C. And I called up a mutual friend of ours and we flew into Washington to say goodbye to him. I flew down from Boston. A friend flew over from Kentucky. We met at the Washington airport. We took a subway out to his, uh, the subway out to his house. He picked us up with his wife at the subway station. We spent the afternoon with him. And he, uh, he told us all about Osama bin Laden two years before Osama bin Laden attacked. He said, there are some bad people out there. So we had lunch together and we visited and then he and his wife drove us back to the airport. No, they, no, they drove us back to the subway station. And we were getting out of the car, and Rolf and I were, were embracing our friend. And our friend, uh, we said goodbye to him, because we knew we'd never see him again. He died two months later. We knew we'd never see him again. And he said to, he said to us, he said, I don't say goodbye. And I looked at him. And he said, I say arrivederci. Arrivederci means I'll see you later. I'll see you later. 
That's what Easter is. Easter is, I'll see you later. Jesus wanted to prepare a place for us. That where he is, we will be also. <laughs> so it's never goodbye. It's a revitherity. I'll see you later. Thank you for your attention. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.